Welcome to Conversations That Matter Podcast. I am John Harris, and I am joined today with a special guest, Eric Muldrow from Code Red Conversations. You can check out his channel on YouTube, and I'm assuming, uh, Eric, do you have a podcast as well, uh, Code Red Conversations, or where can people find you? No, no podcast, not yet anyway. They can primarily find me, again, as you said, on YouTube. That's where I do the the majority of my content, where I create the majority of my content. Um, but I'm also pretty active on Facebook under Code Rare Conversations or on Instagram under the same name. Or you can find me on Facebook just under Eric Muldrow. You'll see Perfect. a picture of me uh, standing at a podium looking, trying to look all official and whatnot. I was giving a presentation, <laughs> which I'll probably end up talking about throughout this video. Yeah. Well, what I want to do today is, and this is going to be an interesting conversation for um, my listeners at, at least, because we talk a lot about the social justice movement and evangelicalism. And of course, right now, there is, um, I'm just going to say it, and you can say it if you want to, but I'm not putting the words in your mouth. I think there's a war on the police right now. And mm. um, I, I, we were talking before uh, we we started recording about your testimony and how you became a Christian. So we're going to first talk about kind of your testimony, cr Christian testimony, and then how you became a police officer. And we're going to talk about this war on, on the police. We're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, systemic racism, um, the future of policing, that should be interesting. So what's right. what's on the horizon um, ahead for uh, as far as crime prevention and um, the militarized police, people are concerned about these things. And so I'm just oh, looking yeah. forward to it. So let's, let's pick up where we left off uh, before we started recording. Eric, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, as, we were say, as we were talking before we started recording, I was basically raised in a, in a Christian home. I, it, it's really weird. We had a, a weird dynamic, my, in which I don't want to have that take up too much of the conversation, but my dad didn't take us to church. He would always go to church, but he would never take us kids to church, um, which is a whole another conversation until we moved to South Carolina, and then I was about 16 or so. Well, we, actually, we moved, I was about 14, and he wanted us to start going to church with him then, but I really didn't want to go. I, I just did not want to go to church. I was like, I remember distinctly when I was little asking my dad, I think I might have been six years old. I remember asking him, can he take us to church with him? And he liter literally said, I'm not taking you bad kids to church with me which like blows my mind. You would think if your kids don't know how to act and you're a Christian, you're a deacon in the church, you want to bring your kids along with you so yeah. that they can hear the word and learn how to live right. But anyway, but it, and it wasn't until I was about 16, 17 years old where I, just, I had a desire where I wanted to start going. So I ended up going. But even then, I, I never really, I, I had a profession of faith for many years. And uh, I was very open about my faith at work because uh, my law enforcement career pretty much extends to working in the prison system and working in the county jail here in Vegas, patrolling the streets here in Las Vegas as a, as a cop. And uh, so I, I, made a, I had a profession of faith and I would actually argue and debate as far as apologetics uh, go with inmates and some of my fellow officers and I, but at the same time, I was living such a hypocritical life. There was such consistent and deep sin in my life. And uh, it wasn't until about, I was 37 or so, where the Lord really got a hold of me. I remember I was, we were saying this before the video started, that I was clicking through the channels and I came across the way of the master on TBN with Ray Comfort. And I saw them on the streets doing witnessing. So I stopped because I loved the apologetic aspect of it. So I stopped and I just was listening. And then I just fell in love with the show, the program. So I would watch it any, every time there was a new episode would come up. It was, a, it was a few months after hearing that and listening and to where the Lord used by his spirit just started really, what, the weight of my sin started weighing so heavily on my heart. And I was truly convicted. And I, I recall, I can't say exactly when and where I was, I was saved, but I can remember just falling on my knees, crying out to the Lord and, and seeking his face in forgiveness and understanding the fact that I'm a sinner and that I didn't want to stand before him and, be, and, and, and face his wrath. I wanted to be one of his. I wanted to be his. 
And uh, man, I'm telling you, that radically changed my life. It, 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 the, the transformation in my life, it wasn't like I was a quote unquote bad dude, bad person, but just a conviction and just seeking him. And it was a process over some years after that and con that continues to this day where the Lord just brought in front of me just some amazing, amazing godly men through history, people I had never heard of. I used to dine on T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen as far as, uh, and Creflo Dollar, as far as people I used to listen to. But just through God's grace, he opened the door at, from hearing, way, watching the way of the master and the Lord using Ray's ministry to bring me to faith and uh, repentance and faith, just the doors that opened up to sound the, uh, biblical preachers and teachers mm. who helped me understand the Bible for the first time in my life. And uh, man, it's just been such a crazy journey over the years. And he, uh, he restored my family. Uh, man, I'm telling you, we can go on and on <laughs> about what, how, how radical a transformation it was in my life. Yeah. Wow. That, that is great. I love hearing that. And I, I think I can speak on your behalf. I, I, I speak this for myself, though. Anyone listening who wants to know how to be in a right relationship with the Lord, um, you can reach out to me. I'm sure you can reach out to Eric, and we would love to introduce you to, to Jesus. So how's Amen. that for <laughs> starting off the whole conversation on a very high point? Um, it, I don't know how it gets better now, but uh, it, it can't, frankly. It's just downhill. But we're going right, to talk right. about uh, policing a little bit and, and hopefully weave into uh, the conversation a bit um, Christianity and um, biblical principles of justice. I, I'd like to hear from you as well. Um, what made you decide to become a police officer in Las Vegas of all places? You know, I've always wanted to be, I can't say always, but for a long time, I wanted to be a cop. Even, even as a kid, before I joined the Army, I wanted to go in as a military police officer. But when I went in, there was a, a, I would have to wait like six months after I graduated high school. And now I'm an old man, you know, I'm 50 years old, just turned 50 this, this year. So we're going back to 88 when I graduated high school. And the movie Lethal Weapon made me want to be a cop. With Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, <laughs> I fell in love with that movie. I wanted to That's be Mel hysterical. Gibson. He was so bad in that movie. I was like, man, I want to be that guy. Yeah. And I wanted to be a cop. So then I, start, I started a journey wanting to be a police officer. But one, like I was saying, when I uh, went to join the Army, they told me I'd have to wait six months. And I was like, man, I want to get basic training. I want to get mm. all this mess over with. So I ended up going in as a medic. But I always had the passion and desire to be in law enforcement. But then when I got out, I went. I, uh, I moved to Indiana and worked as a corrections officer in one of the state prisons out there. And I could have, I have a, I could probably tell you a thousand stories just based on that experience. But then I was pretty much stayed on a path of law enforcement, pretty much uh, from 19, end of 1992 all the way up until 2014 when I retired. There was a break there when I moved to Las Vegas, and I did security for about a year. One in one of, in a couple of local casinos, but then I hired on with the Las Vegas Metro Police Department as a corrections officer in the county jail in '96, and then I transferred out to the streets in 2006, and I finished out my career as a patrol officer. So you have a, a wide ranging career. You've seen a lot of different aspects of crime prevention, criminal yes. justice. Um, I want to ask you then: uh, Is there a war on police right now in this country? Do you think? Oh, no question. <laughs> no okay. question about it. It is. And I've seen this brewing and developing for some years now. And I'm not saying anything that anyone who is uh, reasonable and uh, tries to be rational uh, uh, has, hasn't said before. But it's been so prevalent, it, especially in light of how everything, the, the, the vilification. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. Now, I'm honest and open enough to understand that there's an ugly history with law enforcement here in our country, in particularly amongst the uh, ethnic groups, uh, black folks in particular. I'm not a fool. I've had my own personal experiences with police officers before I became one that weren't good. And uh, growing up in the 70s in New Jersey, a lot of people think that living up north is Oh, it was such a haven of peace, love, and tranquility, but it, was no, it wasn't like that at all. Mm. I dealt with more racism growing up in New Jersey than I did when we moved to South Carolina a few wow. years later. 
it, no, not even on the same level. It was such blatant bigotry, uh, uh, partiality, however you want to term it. There was, it, was so, it, it was to such a ugly degree. Now granted, we were, it was the early 70s we're talking. So we're talking about not far removed from the civil rights movement, but it, I want to ask. I want to interject real quick. So you had you had negative experiences uh, with police officers, and you still wanted to become one. That's interesting to me a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, because I, my dad was like like I was saying, there's some weird dynamics going on with my family. My dad was what was 30 years older, 32 years older than my mom. So, and my dad was from South Carolina, Sumter, South Carolina, as a matter of fact. I've been there. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he, he died in 2003. He was 93 years old. Wow. So you figure in all those years of living, he was born in 1910 in, in the South. So wow. all, those year, all those years of living, he, had, he wasn't always the sweetest and fondest of white people. But at the same time, he never taught us to hate. He never taught us to hate. And even though he had his skeletons and his issues, as we all have, uh, as just being in this flesh, this sinful flesh, he, he, he gave us, he planted seeds in us, uh, foundational roots as far as understanding who people are and not hating, having hate in your heart. So mm -hmm. I think that had a, played a big role in me understanding that. The, and, and then I had a lot of friends also, a lot of friends in school, white kids, who, who, who didn't look at me weird, who didn't mistreat me. So, so I had so that you, balance between bad experiences and then also had some pretty good experiences as, as so well. So you, you were able to separate the office of police officer and the function of the police from the, the bad eggs who gave you oh, a hard time. Absolutely. Which absolutely. Uh, a lot of people are having a hard time with that today. And, and it's, it seems like it's because of this concept, which we hear all the time, that um, it's systemically racist. The police are systemically racist. It's been that way for a long time. It's still that way. And so that means even if you're uh, someone like yourself, who was uh, a black man who wore the badge, you know, uh, wore the uniform, put on the badge, you, you're part of this systemic white supremacy just because you're part of the system. Right. Um, am I understanding that, that correctly then? That's the perception we get from like Black Lives Matter and social justice groups. Absolutely. It's a popular mindset nowadays. It's, on, it's pretty much become mainstream, that, that, pers that way of thinking. But my, one of my big issues with that perspective is how consistent is that? We've all been in, and now, and, and I'm, I have no, I, don't, I take no joy in talking about some of the topics that I discuss when I talk about the issues within the black community. I don't shout these problems out and celebrate them. I point them out because it's ignored through, uh, through primarily through the mainstream media and a lot of these social uh, social justice advocates don't really they they never want to talk about these things. But my big thing is let's be consistent with that. Now we understand that there are issues within the black community: the high, the, the disproportionate crime rate, the disproportionate fatherless home rate. But yet at the same time, if as a black person, if I say uh, if, if someone was to say, you know what, I've had issues, I, I've seen the problem, I've seen the things that some black folks have done, and I've had issues with black people, all, I've been mistreated, or, what, or whatever the case may be, and I don't trust any of them. If, if, let's just say that's the terminology that uh, a person, a white person said who had a bad interaction with a black person, if they use that. Everyone was rail and look at them like you racist. Like how how could you say something like that? How could you judge a whole group of people based on the actions of a few? But yet at the same time, a lot of these same people have no problem whatsoever flipping flipping that around and turning around and, and pointing out the problems within a small group of police officers how they may have been mistreated, and attempting to paint the whole group with uh, as being guilty of the same mindset, same culture. So my big issue is. Be, in, be consistent. If that's, how, if that's your perspective, the white guy who got beat up or, or, or bullied as a kid by, by some black kids or whoever, if they turn around and they use that same argument, don't call him a bigot, don't call him racist, don't call him a hater. You, you should be equally as understanding as you would, for, as you would expect for someone who, who had your perspective. 
Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I wanted to pick your brain on something just to see um, if, if this is just a, a, an idea that I have philosophically speaking, I guess. I had a guy reach out mm -hmm. to me um, a couple of days, well, maybe now it's two weeks ago or so, who uh, he, he got kind of the experience you just shared. He was a bullied white kid and living in an area, I guess, predominantly uh, it, it, where black people lived. I'm not sure exactly where, but he had gotten right. beaten up by black people growing up. And so uh, he had gone to Southeastern, which is a seminary that I graduated from. And Southeastern is very much on the social justice train. And when they, when, when he started hearing things negative about systemic racism and the police and so forth, um, and, and everything else attached to that, he was suspicious of it just because of his own experience. And, and, you know, he, he was very clear with me. He's like, I'm not racist. I don't hold anything against those people. I, they're just, they're people. We have sin. Everyone has right. sin. It's not a black thing, a white thing, a Hispanic thing. A, you go down the list. It's just a human thing. And, and that's where he was coming from. And, and I thought, you know, he's right. That's the Christian understanding that every single demographic is capable of sin, including racism. And, and what seems to be happening right now, this is what I want to get your thoughts on, is, is instead we're, we're kind of taking this concepts of systemic racism uh, in, in policing or other institutions, and we're kind of passing the buck on to them and saying, no, the, the blame for this is society. It's not people. It's not a sinful heart that does sinful things. It's, it's a system. It's something mm. external. And if we can all kind of um, change our environment, so defund the police or uh, somehow re I don't know, do some kind of a new training or reform in the police departments, then, then we will have, I guess, a utopia or we'll get rid of this problem. And I think as a Christian, that's where I have a hard time is, is thinking right. that you're never going to get away from the sin that we all have inside and, and passing the book on to an external system and saying it's the environment that's the problem. It's not our hearts. Is just going to be a recipe for disaster. Do you do you see what I'm seeing on that? Do you agree? Yeah. Oh, I agree 100. percent It's funny. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I'll probably just not name it, just uh, <laughs> just because I don't want to bring any extra attention onto it. But it probably it'll probably be easy to find once I speak on the title. And I'll, I'll be a little vague about it, but they were basically talking about uh, abolition, abolishing the police, not defunding, but abolishing the police. Wow. And it's a quote unquote Christian podcast. No way. 100 <laughs> percent. Quote unquote. A led quote unquote Christian podcast. And they were having a conversation about abolishing, uh, abolishing the police. Now, to be fair, I listened to about 50 percent of it. I didn't listen to the entire podcast. And there was one lady on there, at least one lady on there, who was willing to give some pushback. Even though her worldview is, uh, she's very much a social justice advocate, and she's ha said some pretty crazy things over over the recent over in recent years. But there was a push to, and and they used a lot of the terminology that you just used. It was the system. You 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 re-educate. It was it was. It was almost scary hearing some of the terminology that they were using, re-educating people, take people's guns away because there's so many guns out there. And, and you use it and allow the community to come together and, and, and provide security. And I'm sitting up here, sitting up here listening to, to this mess, <laughs> illogical mess. And you profess to be a Christian but yet at the same time, you're going to assume that this kumbaya, we're going to come together, hold hands, and everything's going to be okay. And it was one point that I brought up in one of my videos. I, I critique black, I have two videos where I critique Black Lives Matter. And one of the points I brought up was the fact that when I went into the hood to police these areas, after some of the worst events, after some of the worst events you could think of, where somebody literally had their house shot up or their kid gunned down on the streets and you go in there as a police officer and you attempt to find out who did this and the pushback and the barriers that you have to face because for various reasons and I know a lot of times people are fearful of repercussions but sometimes it's just a hatred of the police they don't want to give any information out how would these how how do they expect this newfound way of it's not law enforcement of of civil peace of security how do they expect them th these 
these concepts, these individuals to be able to go in and get the job done. What, and, and these are people who actually live in these areas. They're, they're, they really want to emphasize that point. They want people coming from these communities to provide pr protection. And if you have a biblical perspective on that, how can you assume that that won't be without a ton of problems also? Who's going to be the ones to overlook and, and monitor and watch what these individuals do? Uh, or it's, it's just, it, it lacks so much sense. These people I, I, don't think these thoughts, they don't think these ideas and concepts through. I think you hit all. the nail on the head with, some, with the example you gave is, um, I, and the word I hear a lot is village. You said community, mm -hmm. but they want to they wanna create a village right. <laughs> of uh, this community that comes together and we won't need police. And I mean, it, it, you almost want to sing John Lennon's song. Imagine there's no countries. Imagine, <laughs> you know, there's no police. There's no, it's, we're going to take everyone's guns and somehow it's going to be okay. And um and, and the thing about that whole mindset is it's, it's not, the police aren't their concern. It, it's, it's not that they have a problem with police. They have a problem, it sounds like, with any authority. And right. they believe in this egalitarian utopia of some kind. Where, and that's resting on this assumption that men are good. Men, mm. if left to themselves, are good. And we're born into a world that corrupts us. But if we, if we just can get rid of those corrupting institutions, then we're going to be fine. And as Christians, to hear a Christian podcast do that, or a Christian church, I was just reading an article about Matt Chandler's church, which mm. I just thought, I don't know if you've seen stuff from there, but like anti-police stuff that I, I just couldn't believe. You know, these are guys that say that mankind is sinful and needs Christ. And then they come over here and they contradict that opinion. And so, um, so anyway, I'm ranting, but I want to so hear from you. Are, are you surprised when you hear this kind of thing? Um, I, I know that there are three big Christian leaders I know that marched with Black Lives Matter. Like, is that kind of thing a surprise to you? It was back in 2014, when, 2015, when this stuff really started brewing. Uh, when you brought up Matt Chandler, for instance, I used to listen to him me too. Reg routinely. And I used, to, I used to recommend him to my family and my, my kids could listen to him and I would have no concern over it. But as the years have went by and I just started seeing this leftward shift. And now I, I couldn't even, I, there was a time where I would say, well, let me, I would listen to the sermon first. And then I would say, hey guys, check this out. But, I, but and this was when I started seeing him shifting towards this social justice movement. But prior to that, if, if I saw my daughter listening to Matt Chandler, I was like, man, hey, I was, I was thankful because yeah. he, was, he was solid. But now, I, 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 and I'm not saying the man isn't saved. I'm not saying that he's not a Christian. Uh, but I'm saying that he is, he is veered so far off course that to me he's dangerous, that my honest opinion. He's dangerous yeah. in a lot of areas. And he can lead people astray. I'm not saying leaving people uh, off the path of faith or I'm not making any type of claims like that but this social justice movement is so destructive potentially and in in actual in actuality but yeah. as far as and uh, the other people the Bidi Anyabwile I can go on and on men the Eric Mason's men that I used to listen to and just really really appreciate I hope I'm not being problematic by bringing no up yeah, look this is what we, on this podcast we name a lot of those names so oh okay um, no <laughs> that's fine no I I mean the three guys I'll just say the three guys that, that I'm thinking of who are marching with Black Lives Matter were Ed Stetzer, David Platt, and Thabiti Anyabwile they mm -hmm. were public about it and so Thabiti Anyabwile apparently was one of the organizers in, in D.C. Oh my God of the march so I, I i'm here's the hook though here's the thing um the, it all starts with well there's police are there's systemic racism in the police mm -hmm. i want to hear from you is that true we're in the year 2020 you've rubbed shoulders with a lot of policemen i mean your your ministry and your um the focus on your youtube channel is a lot of helpful information on policing and preparing yourself for uh you know, or hedging yourself against criminals etc do you see that? Do you see systemic racism in police? In other words, are police departments characterized by this? Or how do you see that? Not, not at all. I don't see systemic racism as in, in the root of it. What I see are individual problems that may sprout out, sprout up, pop up. And is there such a thing as a racist cop? Absolutely. Every, just like there's a, such a thing as a racist dentist, attorney, uh, doctor 
any field, you're going you're gonna to have individuals in there who have biases and dislikes towards people who don't look like them. Every field. But when you look at policing at its core, you have oftentimes, especially you take a city like Chicago or any major city or even minor small city, but let's, let's take a city like Chicago. You have men and women going into communities, these high crime areas, and that's something that's often overlooked, is that there's such an interaction uh, with uh, blacks coming in contact with the police. It's not primarily because anyone's out to get black folks, because there's, there's an estimate anywhere from half a million to two million cops here in the United States. Those are some of the numbers that I've heard over, over the years. And if there was a, a uh, open season on the black man or black people, and you have two, you have two million people, two million cops, and then you have a system, a whole government system that, uh, at, that supporting them, we, there would be a whole lot more than 15 or 19 unarmed black men gunned down or black, black folks that were killed as when we look at last year. There'd be a whole lot more than that going on. What we often, oftentimes is overlooked is the fact that we have a lot of people, a lot of white, black, brown, Asian, you name the ethnic group, officers going into these communities and they are the main ones who are actually saving more black lives than anyone. Just a few days ago, I was listening to the police chief out of Chicago. And he's a former chief that was in Chicago, was in, was in Dallas when the shooting took place back in, I think it was 2015 or so. I remember that. 2016, 2015, it, it, the year escapes me exactly. I think it was 2016, but he was a, I, I'm probably 2015 anyway. But he was the same sheriff that was that was running the Dallas PD at the time. Now he runs Chicago's police department. He said that just in the seven months that have went by, roughly this year, that Chicago the Chicago PD has taken over five thousand guns off the streets. Over five thousand guns off the streets. Wow! Now just imagine if the police were not there, and this is the inner city Chicago we're talking about. This ain't the suburbs where all the nice areas where, where all the white folks are living. The, this is the, the inner city. Imagine if those cops weren't there and those 5,000 guns were still on the streets. And as bad as things have been this year and every year pretty much in Chicago, just imagine how horrific that would be when you have people out there running these, uh, basically ruling and running these streets. If, and if, so if you remove this, these so-called uh, uh, racist cops, if you take them off the streets, who's going to be out there protecting these citizens who, are, who will be at the, the will of these criminals? So this whole concept of the, the racist system in law enforcement, to me, it's, it's insane. And those who, who use that as an argument, man, it, it, it concerns me with the fact that they just oftentimes just want to completely overlook the, the issue of crime in a lot of these areas. And, and they don't have an alternative, it sounds like. Uh, so one of the things that I've heard, and it's uh, different, looks different in different places, and most people don't have specifics when they say this, is we should just, re uh, we're not radical, we don't want to get rid of the police, but we should reform the police. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's, are, there are reforms, helpful reforms that should be put in place? Or what do you, what do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've spoken um, about some of these issues, in my opinion, on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook and just some random Facebook posts just off the top of my head. I think that change is a needed thing. Uh, let me back up a little bit, and, and I don't want to lose sight of the main question here. But if we looked at the history of law enforcement, if we just go, if we go from the 60s until now, we have seen some radical changes that have taken place just when we look at the, the data and the numbers. Well, let me answer your question real quick. And then hopefully when I get it, I'll get an opportunity. There's some numbers that I'd like to read off just to, oh, share, please. With your, yeah. just to share with your audience. But me, for instance, I, I, like, I think that there's a need in the police academy for somewhat of a military style initially because it's such a challenging job. It could be so difficult. But at the same time, I think that it's problematic because let's say you go through a 20 week 
police academy and you're getting yelled at and you're getting forced to do push-ups and people are screaming at you and you're getting disciplined when you make mistakes. And then after the academy is done, then they send you out to the streets. And then you're expected to be courteous to the person who, uh, who you come in contact with. And one of the biggest complaints, at least here in Las Vegas with our internal affairs, one of the biggest, biggest complaints that citizens, have, that citizens often have or had with officers was discourtesy, cops being rude. And, if, and you, so I, my mindset was always, perhaps the first half of the academy should be uh, tough, more military, military style as far as discipline goes, to make sure that you can handle the stresses on the job. But then after that, you eliminate that aspect of it and you make it more of a classroom setting because you want people to understand these officers or potential officers to understand that you have to go out into these communities and interact with people. And you don't, and everyone doesn't, uh, just because you're, you're a cop and you're dealing with someone doesn't mean that they're a criminal or, or that, and that gives you, and it doesn't give you a right to be a jerk because it is an issue. There is an issue in that, in law enforcement because there are some people get uh, hungry or they let their power go to their head. It, it's what we term in law enforcement as the, 50 pound bad syndrome. Their badge becomes like 50 pounds. You got all that. You might have been <laughs> punked out as a kid or bullied or whatever the case may be. Now you got the badge. Now you got the weight of the whole police department behind you. It can't, power can corrupt. Yeah. That's a very real issue. But at the same time, there are so many systems in place to keep officers in check. Now you have the public, everybody and their mom has a camera phone. You have the citizens review boards. You have internal affairs. You have your direct line supervision. You have your, uh, you have your coworkers. Here in Vegas, we had a policy of truthfulness at all times. If you were caught lying, you're gone. Your job is gone. There was no leeway about it. And then you're talking about the uh, local investigators. You're talking about state level in investigators. You're talking about a nationwide, you have the Department of Justice that can step in if they find an agency is has uh, abused their power. So you have a ton of checks and balances when it comes to police and, and it comes to law enforcement in general. So there have been changes that are taking place. You hear a lot of people, Black Lives Matter, love to spout out every year the cops kill a thousand people and things and it happens every year and things aren't changing. No, that's just a lie. That is just a flat out lie. There are, there's, I'm not saying that cops don't kill people every year, but to say that the number has basically remained the same over the years, that's a lie. People yeah. forget the fact that there are criminals out there who actually want to do people harm. And you have, you have almost 2 million cops making nearly 400 million interactions with the public Addressing criminals on a on a, a very consistent basis, bad things are going to happen. Somebody's going to come in contact with those police officers who does who who doesn't want to go back to jail, who hates cops, who's evil or who's who's violently mentally ill, or he's under the influence of some substance to where he becomes a threat to, yeah. to life or substantial bodily harm to that officer or to someone else. And it may force that officer to have to take that individual's life. That's the reality that a lot of people don't want to face. There's ugliness out there. And it's crazy how many Christians get caught up in that mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. That And, and you know, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have the show Andy Griffith from back in. Oh, what, I love 60, that show. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's everyone wishes, well, most people wish. Um, I wish that, you know, every place could be in a, in a way like Mayberry, you know, that yeah. Andy and, you know, he just, he doesn't even have to carry a gun with them because <laughs> he can talk people out of whatever mischief right. that they want to involve themselves in. One of the things that I've noticed, I've lived in um, North Carolina, California, um, Virginia, and New York. Most of my life has been in New York. And the worst interactions I've had with police officers have been in New York. I actually... My, my audience doesn't know this and you're hearing this for the first time. I slugged a police officer in the oh. face when I was 14 years old in a boy scout uniform. <laughs> now this, I, now everyone's going to want to know the rest of the story and I can't I don't have time to give the whole story, but 
um, I was selling Boy Scout popcorn. You know, Girl Scouts do cookies, Boy Scouts do popcorn. And this police officer came. I was walking, our, our church bordered, a, there was a school on the other side. I was walking uh, from the school where I was selling popcorn to the church. It was like 830 at night. And this police officer came, no lights um, or anything, stopped right in front of me. It was dark. I didn't know who it was and didn't identify himself, came out and grabbed me and just said, get in the car. That's the only thing I heard. Wow. So I slugged him <laughs> and I ran. And then he came after me at a big wealth and, um, you know, <laughs> I had to get my parents together and everything. And he said he could take me to juvenile hall, was trying to intimidate me. And my, you know, my parents said, apologize. And I said, as I was 14, I said, why should I? And my mom kicked me and I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. But I remember after that, I was scared. I thought the police were just out to mm. get me. Um, and I think he felt stupid. You know, this, he thought that there were drugs. Yeah, he screwed up. There was drug related activity. He was a young guy, like really young. He probably fresh out of the academy. Right. And, um, and I've been, you know, I, I remember dating my wife. We, I go through this very liberal town, this college town in New York. I had a little Second Amendment bumper sticker, and I don't know if this had to do with it or not. It might not have been, but I was pulled over more times than I can count. I was searched. I was told to get out of the car and search for drugs. Of course, I never had drugs, but um, I, you know, I, <laughs> my, my, my interactions with policemen in New York weren't always the best. Now, sure. living in Virginia and the places I've lived in um, North Carolina, I haven't really had many bad interactions. They've been more pleasant. And I wonder if that's because of places like New York, they're, man, they're, they're seeing so many more hard to, to see things and they're interacting with just, you know, they, they don't know if they're going to die, you know, to the next day sometimes and, yeah. um, or, or it's just more dangerous. And then in these other places, it is more like Mayberry, you know, it, it isn't uh, as crime. There, there's not as much crime. And so um, this kind of one size fits all reform or, um, uh, an approach to federalize the police force, which is another thing I've heard. It just doesn't seem to me that it would match the communities because we're so diverse. Do, do you agree with that? Or I, Yeah, I think that's a good point. Okay. And I think that what you said about using New York as an example was really good because you have a, uh, in the city of New York, New York City, you have 8 million plus people living there. And you have a with a history, when you, especially if you go back from the 80s to the 90s and into, uh, if I'm not mistaken, into the early 2000s, there, the crime rate in certain parts was so high. The homicide rate was somewhere in the neighborhood of 33 per, for every 100,000 per capita. And, and this what gets into the point of the whole stop and frisk or um, you know, reasonable suspicion stop that they use those tactics, broken windows tactics, to go in and dramatically reduce the crime rate. And that, I'm sure there were other factors that played in also, but you can't overlook a good proactive police officer who patrols his area. Now, I know there were abuses, and that's what caused a lot of the problems that they had. There were some people that, that didn't have, they didn't have any level of reasonable suspicion. They just went in there, they were just stopping people at random. And, Right, and, and some of them were black or uh, Hispanic people that they stopped, but I would say overall, you have that that tactic is something that has been justified in in considered a reasonable and good tactic as far as the Supreme Court and the high, and the uh, other uh, higher courts, and it was something that was allowed to be used, and so. I think every area is different. Like you said, you have some communities that are small town. When I was, I was living in Arkansas a few years ago and you have, it, it was Fayetteville, Arkansas, small, a smaller town. I think 70,000 people might live there if I'm not mistaken. So you have a pretty small town and you do have the University of Arkansas there. So you have a small aspect of the college community that could be a little problematic at times, but it's just a different environment. Everyone's so friendly and nice and cordial out there. And I think a lot of people just don't necessarily, nowadays in our culture, we have everyone wanting to assume that, as you're saying, all cops, this is something, it's an issue with every police officer. If we really look at the percentage of officer of bad shootings or poor uses of force, it is so dramatically low, but the issue is nowadays some of the people who are these advocates for some of these radical policies, they don't care what the numbers say. They don't yeah. care what, what's, what the statistics are. They have their mind made up 
and there's nothing you or I or anyone else who, who may agree with us could say to convince them otherwise. I've noticed that it's all based on one story and it, you know, <laughs> You know, what happened to George Floyd or, or, or something right. like that. And then it's, so one of the things um, that's controversial right now is the chokehold thing. And I was actually, I pulled up a little um, uh, map or something. I think it was USA Today put it out and it was listing all the different cities that have banned chokeholds. And of course, mm -hmm. New York is the most prominent one on that list. What do you think of chokeholds? Is there another, is there a non-lethal way to kind of, <laughs> put someone to sleep or stop them without using a chokehold? Uh, uh. Well, I was a defensive tactics instructor here in Vegas. So, and I'm a jujitsu guy, I'm a martial arts guy. I pretty much done martial arts since I was 17. So this is an area, and let me, I'm gonna use myself as an example. There's, and just to clarify terminology, when we hear the term chokehold, a lot of times we're, think, we're thinking of cutting someone's airway off. And then, but there are also neck holds, restraints, quote unquote chokes that are used where it stops the flow of blood and that could put mm. someone to sleep pretty quick. We have one that is known pretty much nationwide called the LVNR, the lateral vascular neck restraint. And it's, prim it's uh, primarily where the pressure is applied to the carotid arteries. There's no pressure applied to the person's airway and it could take a few seconds to put someone out. I have used that technique on uh, dozens of occasions. Never had one problem, not one problem. I guarantee you that if we look back and we examine the amount of times that officers have used that hold over the years where there have been zero problems, it would probably be the the ratio would probably be ridiculous. Um, the George Floyd incident was was a tragedy, no question about it. The Eric Garner situation tragic, but at the same time, let's it, one a couple of bad occasions where the a tactic was used, and even though and in, in neither one of those cases were those was were was it where there was actual LVNR was used. Yeah, with uh Chauvin, he had his knee on the guy's neck. And then uh with Eric the Eric Garner case, he it, he had more of a chokehold on them. But if if the tactics and techniques are applied better, you can have a much greater success rate. What I believe is that officers should have more training. This whole concept of Take away because a lot of officers go. You're given very basic techniques. You're given you're given very basic tactics to go out on the streets and police these streets, fight crime. Here you go. You you have to recertify uh, two, three, four times a, a year, where the certification may last two hours, and then you're expected to go out there and police. Me personally, I took my job. I understood the, the potential dangers of the job enough to where I trained all the time. I practiced, I stayed in shape. I went to the range on my own, own time. I reached in my pocket and sought out additional training to be better. Mm. But not every, because here in Vegas, we, we were paid pretty well, but not everyone has that opportunity. If you're policing in the example we used earlier, Mayberry, you may not have the opportunity to go somewhere and train. Okay. I do believe that, and, and it kind of piggybacks a little bit off the, on the topic when we're talking about police reform, police changes, which are necessary. I think there should be a higher, there should be some level of a national standard to some degree, some degree. Well, it's funny because yeah, police reform that's being suggested is defunding the police in so many of these right. areas. What you're suggesting is probably more funding for training. So Absolutely. it's the opposite kind of reform. Absolutely. Yeah. Because a lot, and a lot of people aren't seeing that. They aren't seeing the fact that there are that I use it. I, I like to make the comparison between the school system, the public school system and the police. You see problems in this, with the police. What are people saying? Defund the police. The system is broken. It's not working, which is, which I think is, is ridiculous. But you look at these same people oftentimes when it comes to the public school system, Things that the standards have only seemed to gotten have gotten worse over the years. We're producing 
more our kids are more and more ignorant it seems to be the case but yeah, what's the solution on that side? Oh, give them more money. They don't have enough money. <laughs> is the police union not working for you guys? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It must be. It must be the case. So I think that if if the if there's defunding is silly, mm -hmm. keep the funding or if not more and allocate it in the right ways. I think that cops should want the military style minimize that as far as in the, in the initial training academy, increase the ability and opportunity, uh, the training in the area of communication and de-escalating, and give the officers more tools, physical tools. Teach them how to have, teach them skills. The fact that I was proficient in, when it came to defensive tactics, martial arts training, and I was really confident in that area, and in, in kept myself in pretty good shape, that that mm -hmm. kept me from escalating to uh, to the point to where I felt the necessity or the need to use deadly force because I knew I can handle myself in a high percentage of encounters. I didn't. I'm not wasn't an MMA. I wasn't a, a UFC fighter by any stretch of the imagination, but I've never had my my behind kicked, and I've been in plenty of bad situations where I was able to take care of my business. Yeah. And I didn't, and by God's grace, I never had to kill anyone. I've well, drawn I'm, my gun countless times, but never had to fire at anyone, never had to kill anyone. But there, but I know that there were guys that had, if they were in my, my same, in some of those same situations, they would have been, they would have felt the need to, to shoot and kill because they were lacking physically. They had, their, their, their defensive or fighting skills were extremely limited. So their, so their need, what they would consider a threat would be very different from what I would mm -hmm. because of the lack of training, because of the differences in skill and size and strength and things like that. So I think that training needs to be, there needs to be an evolution in training. It shouldn't be a defunding. It should evolve to a greater degree where cops have a greater set of skills. And I, say, and I believe that if you were to make a physical fitness standard for one, and then you give cops the, a, you have a higher standard. You train them in Brazilian jiu-jitsu so they can control people. You would see a reduction, a continual redu reduction in the amount of deadly force shootings or confrontations that we see each and every year. I think that's a brilliant, I mean, you have too much common sense. That's the problem <laughs> with you, Eric. Uh, I want to transition this into kind of the future of policing because this is an excellent springboard here. Um, some people are concerned, and I, I would say I, I, have been concerned in the past about this when I see especially small towns getting um, you know armored vehicles and mm -hmm. uh, automatic weapons or semi-automatic well they should have semi-automatic weapons I'm trying to think I, my mind is fuzzy now because it's been a few years since I've seen news stories on this but right. um, some of these concerns I know are coming back that police uh, departments are becoming militarized and having mili military grade equipment and um, and again I can see that in areas where uh, you, you have a high crime rate, maybe you need more equipment um, in small towns. I, I, I don't see the need for it quite as much. But um, do, do you see police, uh, the police becoming more militarized in some areas? Uh, as um, I mean, I know there's calls to defund them, but it, you know, crime is going to rise inevitably. And I, I, people are concerned that maybe military style uh, tactics will be used. What, what do you think about that? You're talking about a, a primarily equipment? Yeah, equipment. Yeah, I guess equipment is what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, because tactics, yeah. tactics, you have to understand that uh, if we're talking about milita military style tactics, every almost every day I would have to do some semblance of a room clearing when I was a cop, yeah. especially when I police certain areas. You have to go in and make entry with your gun drawn, and you have to do it safely where you put yourself at a, where you minimize the amount of the potential threat for you. So military style tactics and policing, they go hand in hand when it comes down to tactics. When it comes down to equipment, it's a tough call because, and this is my perspective, and this is another thing that I spoke on in one of my recent videos where I critique Black Lives Matter when they mentioned the demilitar uh, demilitarizing the police. I say that, I, I think it's, we, we have such a short attention span and short memory here in the United States because how quick, it, it wasn't that long ago with Columbine, mm. Pulse nightclub, uh, 
the North Hollywood shoot bank robbery. Yeah. The, the, the October 1st shooting here in Vegas, you had people with high level weapons, automatic weapons, who a, a cop with a shotgun and a hand and a handgun is going to have a whole lot of trouble. That whole North Hollywood shootout that changed the game on such a uh, drastic, tremendous level because these cops were un prepared to deal with the level of threat. You had two armor, two uh, well-armed suspects with body armor who had a couple of AKs and they wreaked havoc on those, on that police department, on LAPD, one of the biggest police agencies in the nation, wreaked havoc on those guys. And it took a SWAT team coming in there to finally take the guy down with automatic weapons, with uh, the proper uh, level of body armor and gear. My mindset is we have to remember we're in the 21st century. Terrorism is a real issue. America is a, is a greater, is, has so many enemies externally and as we, as we see lately, internally. And people are liable to do almost anything. There's a huge black market out there for weapons, explosives. So do I think that this whole move towards militarizing the police is a is necessarily a bad thing i don't i do not i don't think so at all because there's so many different threats that we face nowadays i think cops need those weapons i think that tactically there's some t things that can change tactically and some better decisions as far as how these some of these uh, some of this equipment is utilized but I would say overall, I think that the day and age that we're living in, just because you live in small town USA doesn't mean that you can't have a, a uh, Unabomber or someone like that yeah. lurking in the midst somewhere. It's possible. And of you course, know, you know, so we I, have to be prepared for that. As you say this, I mean, you, you sound like a guy, too, from our conversation. Uh, you had mentioned something about uh, an armed populace. I don't remember exactly what you said, but you're, you believe citizens should also have the right to defend themselves. And Absolutely. Yeah, so, so a combination then, really, of, of police who are equipped for these kinds of threats and citizens who are ready for them as well would probably be the ideal no question. Um, situation. Um, I, what about, so when people, we will call for, when they say oh, the police are getting too militarized, and then I see videos on my social media of just, what was it, last week in Chicago, a bunch of police, I think they were surrounding a Christopher Columbus monument, and they're getting pummeled. I don't know if you saw this video. Oh, my um, gosh. And, and I, I looked at that video, and they, I mean, they, they're just having glass and all sorts of things thrown at them. I think some guys had some bloody heads afterward, and they're not doing anything. They're just standing there as targets. Right. And I look at that, and I wonder, who wants to become a police? And, and I have no doubt the media has to be part of this. They don't want to be shown in the media as you know, uh, responding with force, because they know that's the clip that will probably be shown. But if you're a young kid and you want to grow up to be a police officer, I feel like that would damper your spirit. Are you seeing a, a, a problem with recruitment or do you know of a problem? Yeah, I've done some research on that topic and I've, I've heard that nationwide in a lot of places that the, there's been a 60% reduction. This was last year in oh the year goodness. prior, 60% reduction in the amount of recruits uh, eligible or good recruits that the police officers that a lot of police departments are seeing. Wow. And so it like, just like you said, when you see, I watched that whole, I watched a full extended clip of that whole incident in Chicago and you see people sneaking up in the background and they're dumping out wa frozen water bottles. That's what they were throwing at these cops. And one guy had a fractured or orbital bone as a result of that. You had 48 cops injured. 18 of them had to go to the hospital. One of them had a fractured kneecap. You see that, you see what's going on. All you have to do is just look, scroll through Instagram or Facebook and you see some of the clips that are taking place in New York on a nightly basis or in a lot of, unfortunately, in a lot of these other liberal towns. Why would any people getting cussed at, getting in your face, talking crazy and you can't do anything because, or, or even if you look at the Rayshard Brooks shooting in Atlanta which I think the officer was completely justified in doing what he did right you take an incident like that especially if you look at the, the letter of the law in Georgia you take an incident like that and then you see a cop who's looking at 
murder charges. You combine those and then which your some of your maybe some of your favorite rappers or some of your favorite actors are vilifying the police. Who wants to be a cop? Yeah. I'm telling you, if I was still working right now, I probably probably would have left or uh, or I would have been working on my paperwork to get out of there. We need to bring back uh, so ridiculous. Re reruns of Lethal Weapon to get them back in interested again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> um Danny Glover and Mel Gibson can do it. Um <laughs> Yeah, man, that I, I suspected that. I didn't realize it was 60% of a drop off. Uh, and this the, is a year ago. I can imagine oh, once yeah. 2021 comes around, they look at the, the statistics for 2020. It's, it's got to be, it's got to be even higher than that. So is, is the Ferguson effect real then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Use all, we see the crime rate in places like New York, there's some weekends where certain aspects of the crime rate has increased by up to over 300%, 200%, bur uh, homicides up, ro robberies up, burglaries are up, all over the nation. And all of these towns that have advocated for defunding or abolishing the police, you see an increase in Chicago, increase in crime. The, so, and why is that? Because being proactive nowadays as a cop is almost career suicide. You are putting yourself in a position, you answer the call for service, you get there. And I don't want, I don't want to make this video out to be me just be, simply being a cop apologist <laughs> because I understand that there are problems out there within the police community, that there are bad cops. A lot of people say the 1% or less than 1%. I don't know what the numbers are, but there are cases where officers have kept their mouths shut because they don't want to, they don't want to uh, yeah. shake, shake, rock the boat. They saw bad things taking place. And, and I've been in, I was in a situation early on in my career. I have a video on my channel called police brutality, uh, where I did give a full presentation. It's, it's about 45 minutes long, separating fact from fiction. And the, one of the first things I speak on was my first day of field training where I saw an officer, my field training officer, beat the mess out of some guy for no reason, just because of the fact that he didn't like the way he looked at him and he ran his mouth a little bit. And I was forced to be in a dilemma. Here I was just hiring on my former job. I made seven bucks an hour. And then I'm hiring on with a job that more than doubles my pay instantly. And I'm forced to be in a situation where I have to have a moral, where my morals are being challenged. What do I do? Do I sit back and I not say anything at all? Do I join in or do I say something? Ultimately, I said something. I could not sit. And this was even before I was saved. I, like I was saying, I knew, uh, I knew about God, but I didn't have a solid, true relationship with him. And I was faced with that moral dilemma of what to do. And it was a hard, and I really wrestled with that in my head. And I was 26, 27 years old at the time. So I can imagine, and I'm not making excuses for anybody, but there are issues within, there can be issues within policing when it comes down to the decision making that uh, an officer makes because of peer pressure. But when we get set back and we, so I just wanted to say that, but going back to your primary question, about the uh, uh, Alec, the uh, is there a Ferguson effect or not? There is a definite factor that the police officers have been so vilified these days, where the primary emphasis has been on those few bad encounters, or tragic, or evil, or horrific encounters, and no one even looks at the vast, vast majority of positive interactions that the police have, police officers have. So if you're a cop out there and you're just trying to do the right thing, a lot of cops are like, man, why should I even bother? I'll wait till they call me and place me on a call. And then I'll, if there's a 911 call that comes in, I'll go to that and I'll address it. And even then you gotta be leery. Well, we believe that the police serve a function which is a function for true justice. The government does not bear, it says the sword in vain. That is force, right. that's lethal force. And um, what can people be doing, especially Christians who listen to this podcast uh, to support 
pray for, um, help. Um, yeah, just, I guess, <laughs> offset some of the negative, um, movements that are trying to defund and, and deplatform police. I, w- I think you nailed it at first, as far as just stay in prayer, stay prayed up, keep our focus primarily, understand that God is ultimately in control of everything that's going on. None of this is taking him, taking him by surprise. It's, it'd be not, if you see an officer, sometimes just offering a nice word of encouragement can go a long way. It's, it's a very thankless job. And the reality, the reality is we I know there are a lot of believers who believe that Christians shouldn't get involved in elections and things like that. And people have their own conscience and they have to go with where they feel comfortable. But you have right now this silent minority, the vocal minority is who's being heard. And a lot of people don't want to interact and get involved in a lot of these matters because they don't want to be looked on and viewed as being a bigot. They don't want to be called a hater or racist or whatever the case may be. I, I'm sorry. There, I think there are too many things at stake within in our country to sit back and remain silent anymore. There are mm-hmm. way too many things at stake. Our freedoms, to a large degree, are at stake. If the cops are abolished or defunded, and you, we're already seeing the, the uh, repercussions of that across our nation. Is your personal safety worth it just to sit back and do nothing, say nothing, because you don't want somebody blocking you on Facebook? Is it, is it really that serious? Does, is being popular or like that important to you? Or would you rather be in a, be, I'm just very thankful that we live in a country that affords the freedoms that we have. Because if you look across the world, look at a place like China, different parts of Africa, you see there are a lot of, most of the world doesn't have, they don't have the freedoms and opportunities that we have. I -hmm. think people just need to be consistent and we need to be, be willing to take a few licks here and there. And I'm not talking about physically, but be willing to take a few hits and being called a couple of ugly names. How, if anyone thinks it's easy, it's how it's tough out there. Imagine being a black Christian conservative, former police officer. Oh man. Talking against Black Lives Matter and talking about some of these topics. You must with get other black folks. You must Just be called names. Say yeah. Again. You must be called names at All times. All the time. But you know what? Honestly, I just think that I, my mindset is truth matters to me more than anything else. Amen. At, at my heart, I am more of an introverted guy. <laughs> I'm not a guy out there wanting to. If you watch some of my earlier YouTube videos, man, I look ridiculous, you know, I, 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 and, and I do a, a tremendous, I, I think I do a pretty good job of editing because a lot of times I sound like a bumbling idiot <laughs> throughout the course of some of my videos and I chop, them up, I chop them up pretty good. So it flows a whole lot better, but I'm a guy who kind of likes my space. I like staying at home, but when it comes down to the issues, when I see the state and the, the progression that this country path this country is heading down man i'm telling you for the i i I wonder i wonder how the non-believer gets deals with that the Mm non-believers who are may have more conservative values they must just be so dependent on the government and their gun like that must be it because ultimately it's like where where's their hope where's their true hope we know that as christians we know that this this uh this world is not our own it's not our home so we have that hope but just as, an, just as to sum up what we're saying, just offer some encouragement, stay prayed up first and foremost, uh, understand that God is sovereign, he's in control, and be active if you, if you feel led legislatively. Get out there and get involved, Have, let your voice be heard, and share some of this information, some of the info that's out there, and so and let people know that because there's so many lies that are being told, so many lies that are being told, and somebody has to share the truth. Amen. Yeah. Well, Eric, uh, thank you so much for joining me and uh, taking part in this long-form discussion because I think it does help people uh, just to, to hear it from you with the, the experience you have as a police officer. If you want to find out more about um, Eric's podcast, uh, you can go to Code Red Conversations on YouTube and check out uh, his channel. And I'm sure there'll be more content coming. In fact, uh, I think it might've been the video you sent me, Eric, uh, was helpful about uh, 
um, making sure that there's not overgrown plants in your yard because criminals could hide in, in, in there. And I was like, oh, that's actually a good point. I never really thought about that. Right. So um, a lot of helpful, practical information. So thank you once again, Eric. God bless you. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yep. Bye now.